Thanks, Sergey, for the invitation and thanks also for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I should apologize uh, that I'm not talking so much about human history today, but I'm focusing on pandemics and not just because this is really, I guess, up to date. Some of you might even be sick to hear about pandemics, but uh, therefore I'm uh, kind of turning the focus more into the past and into past pandemics and what we can maybe learn from ancient DNA about the uh, history and evolution of, of, of pathogens, which is uh, something that uh, I was doing together with my uh, group and my colleagues over the last few years. Um, so when I started this, which was probably about uh, 10 years ago, um, we realized that there's surprisingly little known about the early evolution of pathogens. So if you think about tuberculosis, for example, um, which is caused by mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis, um, it wasn't even clear did that emerge a thousand years ago, 5,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, where did it come from? How did it adapt to become a human pathogen? What is the evolutionary rate, so the mutation rate of that pathogen? So how does it change through time? How does it become adapted to humans? So it used to be an animal, probably pathogen, like we now have a corona, which probably came from, from bats or from, from the pandolin. Um, but uh, that's also true for most pathogens. At some point, they were in animals, and then they became adapted to humans. But when did it happen? How did it happen? What changed? So those were big questions that, to my surprise, people had almost no idea about. And the reason why they don't really have an idea about that is that if you want to study evolution, you have to look at, at, at fossils, right? So if you study human evolution, we look at Neanderthals, we look at Homo erectus, we look at uh, Australopithecines, and probably you have already heard a lot from Martha Lahr or uh, uh, Chris Stringer or other people um, in, in the series that will tell you about like, the fossil record, the archaeological record, but we don't really have that for pathogens. Um, because they don't really fossilize well. We don't really have, you know, their kind of structure from 5,000 years ago or so. Even if we would have it, it would just be a shape. It would just be a cone-like structure. We wouldn't even know what bacterium it might be. And this is why we then became interested in that and thought we can maybe change that. We can actually create a fossil record for pathogens by studying ancient genomes from pathogens. So with a research field that we now call ancient pathogen genomics. So we can go back in time, take bones from the past and extract maybe the, the DNA from them and then reconstruct those pathogens that were present in past populations. So how do we do that in this work that we also call archaeogenomics or genetics? We take ancient fossils, an ancient skull, for example, um, and then from the tooth often, uh, we extract DNA because a tooth from an ancient fossil has preserved not just the DNA, which might be stuck inside the bone structure, so the, the dentine, which is part of the, the tooth, but um, also the dried blood that was once flowing through the, uh, th through the pulp chamber, so through the cavity inside the, 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 the tooth. And then if we extract the DNA from that, we could actually not just get the DNA of that person, but we could also potentially get the DNA of the pathogen that might have killed that person a thousand years ago, 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. And then the DNA that we drill out basically as part of bone powder gets released and we can then prepare that for DNA sequencing in those high throughput sequences, which many of you know have been you know, improved a lot over the last few years. So there's actually those machines now produce 100 million times more data than 15 years ago. So it's really incredible. We are in a genomic age. The human genome only costs a few hundred euros, whereas 15 years ago, it cost billions of actually dollars or euros to produce a human genome. So it's really, it's a new age uh, that we're in now. So in using this technology, we were then able to go back in the past, study ancient pathogens, and now produce a molecular fossil record for pathogens to learn about mutation rates, to learn about the interaction between the host and the pathogen. So how did the pathogen adapt to us, but maybe also how did we adapt to the pathogen um, and also identify agents that caused pandemics in the past. So from historical records, for example, from archaeological records, we often have evidence for large scale epidemics, maybe even pandemics in the past. And now we can actually know what pathogen caused, say, the Black Death that I will talk about, so like large scale pandemics that happened in human history. And I've doing, been doing this work um, largely with those uh, three colleagues, um, uh, Kirsty Alexander, who are currently also group leaders um, in our Institute for Evolutionary 
um, Anthropology at uh, Leipzig, so Max Planck Institute, uh, but also with Verena, who was my first PhD student actually 10 years ago, and now she's a professor in Zurich, but we're still uh, collaborating. In fact, I just came off the telephone with her uh, five minutes before the presentation, so I was still uh, interacting really well. Um, so we did work a lot on the genetic history of, um, of a plague, which will be the main focus of today's presentation, but we also worked on leprosy and on the kind of evolutionary history of, of leprosy. We could even trace it back together with Verena now to Egyptian mummies. So we have the first genomes of leprosy um, from, from, the, uh, from ancient Egypt. Um, we looked also at syphilis and that also was several studies where we looked at kind of early contact period. It's thought that syphilis came from the new world into the old world, which I think we have now pretty much supported with our genetic data, but there was a form of syphilis already in Europe before it was introduced from the new world, which we now know is yours, which is a close relative. That was already in Europe before syphilis came, which was uh, actually quite a surprising and interesting finding. We've also looked at tuberculosis and again, don't really have time to go into detail here, but what we found, for example, was that tuberculosis, which was present before Columbus in the new world, like in North and South America, was actually a very interesting form of tuberculosis, was actually one that we today find in pinnipedes, like in seals and sea lions. So there was a zoonotic transmission, so probably from exploiting seals, especially in South America on the coast of Peru, for example, and Chile, they were um, exposed to this pathogen that today we only find in seals and sea lions, but in the past, uh, we actually found it in, in South America, as well as in North America, in um, uh, in humans. So it was kind of a, a, a zoonotic transmission, then probably an adaptation to, 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 to humans. We also looked at Salmonella enterica, which causes typhoid fever. Um, it's also uh, pretty much still common today in the world. Um, and we could trace that back now to hunter-gatherers, in fact, some of the oldest bacterial genomes that we have now reconstructed um, from Eastern Europe. But then we get the whole history of Salmonella enterica evolution, how it becomes a human pathogen through kind of various stages and processes to then actually cause some major outbreaks, um, which we could also reconstruct from the New World. So in the 16th century, there was an introduction to Mesoamerica, and we think we have good evidence that it was responsible for the Cocolitzli pandemic that happened uh, first time in 1545 in Mexico. Um, and then uh, there was a second and a third outbreak in the uh, 1570s and 80s. And it seems that Salmonella enterica was involved in this uh, large scale outbreaks. And we were also quite um, happy and lucky that we could work with this gentleman here, which is the Iceman, which was this ice mummy that was discovered about 20 years ago. Uh, which was stuck in the ice for 5,000 years in, uh, in Italy, so northern Italy, southern Austria. It was, as you might know, a lot of debate whether it was in Austria or in Italy. I think it was 20 meters in Italy and not in Austria, so now it's exhibited in, in Italy, but for us it was good because our collaboration partners there in Italy uh, made it available to us and we, we together worked on the stomach content of the Iceman and could actually reconstruct Helobacter pylori, which many of you actually carry in their stomachs, and we could now also look at the evolution of Iliobacter pylori through the last 5,000 years, which was very exciting. But again, today, I don't really have time to talk about all those other pathogens. It would all take an hour, but I really want to focus on Yersinia pestis and what we learned over the last 10 years um, about the evolution of Yersinia pestis. So Yersinia pestis is actually not really a human disease. It is actually something that today you find in rodent populations, in wild rodents, like in, in North America, for example, you'll find it in prairie dogs, right, the groundhogs. Um, and it's, it's found mostly in those wild rodent populations, and it's transmitted within those rodent populations by a vector, and the vector is a flea. And it's actually interesting to see how this transmission is happening, because how it works is that a flea bites, for example, an infected individual that has plague, and then the flea takes the bacteria in the blood meal into its stomach, and here the um, bacteria, they build up a biofilm that actually causes a blockage of the gut. So the flea cannot swallow any more blood. And that causes the flea to starve. And what then the flea is doing is it gets crazy because it's starving. So it bites again and again and again. And every time it now bites, it sucks the blood. And the blood then comes in contact with this blockage, which is made out of the bacteria. The bacteria get released into the blood, but then it has to spit it out again because it can't swallow it. So with every bite, 
the flea is basically transmitting the bacteria. And then you can imagine that this is a very efficient way of bacteria to get transmitted because those fleas, they bite up to 200 times a day if they have blockage, whereas usually a flea bites five to 20 times a day. So they really get crazy. Apparently at some point they starve. Some of the researchers working on that told me so that really after like 10 days or so, the flea is actually dying because it's starving, but that's enough time for the disease actually to spread. And then it spreads within rodent populations. Eventually those rodents might die because they die of plague like humans die of plague. And then the bacteria travel to the closest kind of warm body, which can be another rodent, or it can be actually a commensal, an animal that lives together with humans, such as um, cats or dogs or rats and mice. And those rodents are also a good reservoir for the population of fleas and kind of Yersinia pestis, because they live in kind of larger groups or populations as well. And then if that happens, then they get in contact with humans, because if then the rat dies, it might also directly jump to a human. And what then happens is if a human gets infected, the flea bites, the bacteria get inserted into the human body, that would also be true for other mammals, the bacteria actually travel to the lymph system and through the lymph system they get to the lymph nodes and the lymph nodes they get infected and then they get big because the bacteria have learned over their evolution to, inv to evade the human immune system. So they don't really, they, they can't really be taken up, they can't really be identified because they actually retreat to macrophages which are kind of part of the human immune system. So they cannot be seen, they kind of double, they multiply and then the lymph node becomes really big and that is the bubo, that's why we call it bubonic plague. If you would open that up, it's full of pus. So it's really kind of like a largely infected um, uh, bubo. And then from there through the lymph system, it enters actually the blood. Um, and then in about 50 to 70% of all cases, it causes quite severe um, uh, sepsis. Um, and then in about 50 to 60% of all cases, it actually causes uh, death within seven to 12 days. So it's really high mortality. Mortality is more than 50% if it's not treated. So it's a very severe disease therefore. And that's actually not the only form of plague. There's another type of plague, and that's not the bubonic form, but there's something where if people get an infected lung, they might actually cuff out little particles, and then somebody else might inhale the little particles with the bacteria, and then the bacteria enter first the lung. And that can actually be a very severe form uh, of plague. That's the pneumonic plague that has even a higher mortality, mortality that is above 90%, and it is much faster because they kind of find perfect conditions within the lung, lung to actually uh, divide. And if you then show the first symptoms, it's usually even late for antibiotic treatment. So even today, pneumonic plague is very severe. It can actually uh, be lethal. It kills within uh, 48 hours. Um, and that's also why plague is considered today as a potential threat. Um, and a lot of uh, defense ministries, in fact, in the world are doing research on Yersinia pestis because it could be used by bio terrorists or even as a bioweapon. So people are really afraid so somebody would like to release it in a subway, for example, that could really be uh, uh, causing a large outbreak uh, because it would then enter the lung first and uh, even treatment with antibiotics might be too late. It is still found in the world today. So a lot of people think plague is something from the past, but in fact, uh, we have thousands of cases in human populations um, in, in, in all continents in the world. And the largest outbreak you might remember was just a few years ago in Madagascar, but uh, it's mostly found in Central Asia and rodent populations, but there it also then enters humans. But you do find it also in North America. So that's also, you know, some of you might've been in the Grand Canyon or might even be close to the Grand Canyon right now. And um, if, you, if you walk down there, you see even warning signs, you shouldn't feed the squirrels because they carry Yersinia pestis. It is actually around also North America, like I said, in, in groundhogs, for example. Um, and uh, it, it jumps into humans. Fortunately, we have very powerful antibiotics, um, so we can actually treat it. Um, but still, there's a few hundred people that, that die every year. Um, but the mortality, of course, untreated in the past was much higher uh, than it is uh, fortunately today. In the past, it has caused some of the kind of biggest pandemics that we know from historical records. The oldest uh, one that we also call, uh, call the first uh, plague pandemic uh, was actually in the sixth century. Um, it was called a Justinianic plague uh, based on Justinian, who was the emperor of the East Roman Empire at the time, and he contracted it himself. He actually survived. Uh, he was lucky in that way. 
um, but it, 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 it wiped out, you know, half of the, the population in, 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 in the East Roman Empire, at least based on some historical records, even though there's some debate about how many people exactly died, which is hard to, to reconstruct based on historical records, but certainly it was many people um, that have died in this, in this first um, outbreak, and then it lasted for about 250 years in Europe until the 8th century when it then disappears, so it is gone. We have no record of plague um, after the 8th century, but then it has really a, a big comeback, and that is in the uh, 14th century when it comes back with the so-called Black Death. And the Black Death is a kind of short period, only five years, um, and uh, it kills probably half of all Europeans. Again, then uh, plague is around in Europe for maybe 300 years, 400 years, until then the um, 18th century when it then disappears from Europe for good, so it doesn't come back. We don't have plague, uh, large outbreaks at least, in Europe um, after the 18th century. But there is a third pandemic, and that is the so-called Hong Kong plague, which uh, starts in the Yunnan province um, in uh, uh, southwestern China, and then through Hong Kong, uh, it actually spreads all over the world. So the reason we have it in the Grand Canyon today, so in America, why we have it in Africa, um, is actually because of this outbreak where with steamships and shipwrecks, the disease is actually disseminated all over the world to the Pacific, to America, to Africa, Madagascar, all those places get this particular strain uh, actually from this, from this Hong Kong plague. And that's also the time when uh, the uh, pathogen itself is actually identified by Alexander Yersin, who is um, a researcher who was sent from the Pasteur Institute to, to research on this pathogen. He actually finds it. He, it's also named after him, and he already identifies this interesting pattern of the cycle with the flea blockage and transmission, and, and the flea being the vector to actually transmit the disease. Um, and then in the 1950s, it disappears because of antibiotic treatment. At least it's not seen anymore as a pathogen within humans. But you could say, some people actually argue, that the third pandemic is not over because you still find it all over the world, right? So it's the question, when is a pandemic over? probably a question that many of us will be discussing and talking about over the next year with the corona pandemic. It's also the question, will it ever be over? If you ask me, no, we will probably have corona for the rest of our lives because it will just become part of our uh, seasonal, uh, basically, viruses that, that cause uh, the common cold. Um, the first pandemic uh, about Yersinia pestis that we, that we did um, analyze uh, more intensively was the Black Death. Why did we do that? Because as I mentioned, the Black Death is really the kind of, you know, most famous probably pandemic in human history. Um, it's the largest one that we know of. It, it killed half of all Europeans, as I mentioned. Um, it's a very short period. It's, it's five years, which at that time was rather short because it spread all over Europe um, um, already in this kind of early medieval time. Um, based on the historical records, it was introduced from the east. So you can actually reconstruct the route based on historical records. The oldest records are from Kaffa, which was a colony um, in Crimea. Um, and surprisingly, Crimea is not just a kind of a, a war zone, or maybe not a war zone, I shouldn't say that, but a region with uh, conflicts um, uh, in, the, in the 21st century, but there were already uh, conflicts there uh, during that time. It was actually a colony from the Genoese, so from kind of this Mediterranean uh, uh, Genoa uh, population. Um, and they were attacked, uh, besieged by um, the Mongol Empire, the, the Golden Horde Empire at the time. Um, and they were catapulting dead people during the siege into the city. And it's said that from those dead people, and this, the disease was actually spreading. So it was, it's the first recorded um, actually bioweapon use, um, this the siege of, of Kaffa. And then uh, the, the Genoese had to retreat. Uh, during the retreat, they took the, the disease on their ships and they brought it to Constantinople, they brought it to Messina and Sicily, and then also to Marseille and Genoa. And from there, it spread all over the continent. And you can actually nicely see how in waves it goes over the continent over the next uh, five years, and then basically yeah, killing uh, uh, millions of people. It's an estimated 50 million people that die within this five-year time period. It has been suggested already in the past that Yersinia pestis was the causative agent of this historical pandemic, um, but the, 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 the historical records, they don't match up so well. So if you kind of read about how, the kind of disease symptoms, a lot of people argued, maybe it's not Yersinia pestis, it's a virus, it's a different disease. Some people said it's like a hemorrhagic fever, like Ebola. So there was a lot of debate whether the Black Death was actually caused by Yersinia pestis or not. And that also motivated us 
10 years ago to then say, okay, let's look at this first. Let's look what actually caused the Black Death, which was the pathogen that has been responsible for this large scale pandemic. So fortunately, we had access to a very interesting connection. Uh, we worked on material which comes from the 14th century London, actually from a, a cemetery that was only used during the Black Death, which is called the East Smithfield Cemetery. And what we did is we extracted DNA from the corpses from that time because we said, okay, <coughs> excuse me, if those people uh, died of uh, this disease during the Black Death, we would probably also find the pathogen has killed them in, in, the, in, those, in those ancient skeletons. But it's not totally straightforward because if you extract DNA from an ancient skeleton, it's not just the DNA of that person. It's also the DNA from the surrounding bacteria, plants, all kinds of organisms that have been present in the sediment in this kind of environment where the skeleton was for the last 650 or 680 years. Um, and only a tiny proportion of that DNA is actually human. And an even smaller proportion is the pathogen that killed that person. So it's really challenging to pick out those few fragments that might be from the pathogen. So we had to develop methods to actually fish out the DNA that we're interested in to kind of reconstruct, for example, the full genome. And how we do that is with a method that we call targeted enrichment. Um, so capture, so we have little pieces of glass. Um, on the surface of that glass, uh, we can synthesize DNA sequences, millions of DNA sequences. And in this case, we, we synthesize the DNA that is complementary to Yersinia pestis, so of modern Yersinia pestis, that looks similar. Similar enough that the two DNA fragments, if they kind of see each other and they're complementary, they will bind to each other, right? DNA has this wonderful property, it's a double strand. And if it sees the opposite kind of side, the C and the G and the A and the T, they bind to each other like magnets. And that's basically what we did here. We fished out the DNA that is similar to Yersinia pestis, about 90% similar is enough. And everything that was not similar, we can just wash away. And by that, we enrich for the interesting Yersinia pestis DNA. And then we can stick it into one of those wonderful machines and we get millions of DNA sequences. And you can actually see it was quite successful. So we had very little Yersinia pestis DNA before we did that. And afterwards, uh, it was very highly enriched. And that was then enough to actually reconstruct the entire genome. Um, so it's something that we then published 10 years ago. And we could actually reconstruct about 99% of the genome from Yersinia pestis from that kind of time. So it's a really good quality. 30x coverage means that we've seen every position about 30 times. So we're pretty confident that the sequence that we have reconstructed is actually real and that we have every position in the genome, right? So it's, it's really a high quality genome. The 1% that is missing is usually parts of the genome that are repetitive. They are not really informative. So we really have a good high quality genome and that we also now have for many other ancient pathogens. What we can then do is we can then do family trees of pathogens. We can see how are the pathogens from the past related to the pathogens that we have in the world today. So when we do that for Yersinia pestis, this is actually the family tree of modern day Yersinia pestis. So branch one, you would have, for example, the pathogen you find in the Grand Canyon or Madagascar that was spread during the Hong Kong plague. Um, and then you have those other branches here in, those branch one to branch four, they comprise about 80% of the diversity we have in the world today. You have this branch zero, which is some other strains, more kind of unusual strains you don't really find only in certain pockets somewhere in Central Asia. In general, in Central Asia, you have the biggest diversity. That's also why most people think that Central Asia is probably the place of origin uh, for Yersinia pestis. And here it branches off from Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. That's actually a different uh, a, a pathogen. It can also be pathogenic, but it's mostly an environmental um, uh, a, a bacterium that you find in soil. So it's a soil dwelling bacterium. If you, if you ingest that, it can actually cause um, uh, gastrointestinal uh, diseases, but it's not really transmitted by fleas or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's just an environmental um, a pathogen, but it's, it's, it's nothing like Yersinia pestis, but it's pretty closely related. So one of the first questions then was, now that we have Yersinia pestis from the Black Death, how does it relate to modern day Yersinia pestis? And there were all kinds of speculations that people had before. <laughs> it just looks like the modern day or it looks completely different because today it doesn't cause pandemics anymore, but it did in the past, maybe it's something else. What we found to our surprise was, maybe it's not surprising now anymore, but at the time it was, the one from London from 660 years ago actually falls on the base of the most of the strains that you find in the world today. It actually falls here on this branch one as the common ancestor of all the genomes that fall in this branch one today. So it's the mother, if you want, of most 
of the diversity found in the world today and basically all the strains that are part of this branch one. So the one you find in the Grand Canyon, the one you find in Madagascar, you find still in China and in Central Asia, they're all going back to this London strain from the Black Death. And that makes sense because it was a large event, right? It's like today, Corona. If you look at the phylogeny of Corona, it goes back to Wuhan, surprisingly, to China, where the diversity was born that you see in the world today. Uh, and that was the same here. The Black Death gave rise uh, to this diversity we find largely in the world today. Um, and what's also interesting is that it's the common ancestor. It literally doesn't have any position in its genome that is not found in the children, like in the strains that got born out of it. So it doesn't have anything special. And that's also important information because it basically means that the strains you find in the Grand Canyon today, you find in Madagascar today or in Central Asia, could theoretically, if they would be catapulted back in time, cause the Black Death again. There's nothing special, right? It's not that this particular strain of bacteria that was circulating in Europe in the 14th century was special. No, it probably has the same mortality. It's the same, it's the same biology, right? It's nothing special. It would cause the Black Death again if we would bring it back in time, today from the Grand Canyon or today what you find in Madagascar, which also means it's, it's still out there, right? So theoretically, if we wouldn't have antibiotics and if we still would have a lot of fleas and if we still would be rat infested uh, environments that we would live in like in the medieval time, it would be a high chance we would you know, get another Black Death. So fortunately, we don't have that situation. Hopefully, we will not have that situation again uh, in the future because it is still a threat um, if it would uh, get into the right uh, conditions. What we have done over the last few years is we have actually looked at more uh, genomes from the past. We have actually reconstructed post-Black Death genomes from many different sites in Europe, as you can see here. That was a work that was mostly done by Maria Spirou, who was a PhD student and later on a postdoc. And what we found uh, was actually quite interesting. One of the genomes that she, that she analyzed um, is one that is from Eastern Europe. It's actually not too far away from Crimea, from a, call, a site called Leishevo. And uh, this is from just before the Black Death. And surprisingly, on the phylogeny, it actually falls one mutation away from the London Black Death strain. So it actually falls basal to that. It's actually one mutation away from the what was recent common ancestor and has one mutation that kind of is basal of the, of the Black Death. So out of that, basically, the Black Death evolved. And that confirms the story of the kind of uh, the, the siege of, of, of Kaffa and the origin in Eastern Europe and coming from Eastern Europe to Western Europe, right? Because that's how you would expect it, that the kind of the one that is kind of more basal would evolve into the Black Death uh, over the course of, of moving there. What Maria also had was other Black Death genomes from this pandemic, from the five-year pandemic. So from France, from Germany, from uh, Spain, and the one from London. And what she found was actually a big surprise. They're all genetically identical, right? So basically, it seems that the Black Death, this five-year initial uh, period of, 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 of it spreading in the medieval time, was caused by a genetic clone. There was no difference. It's not like today in Corona when people talk about the UK variant or the South uh, African variant or so, which is new mutations that have uh, arisen in, in the coronavirus, bacteria don't evolve as fast as viruses. So within five years, it seems that the, that the bacteria actually did not change at all. It was a clone. Basically, 50 million people died of a 100% identical bacterial clone. And that also makes sense that now we know the mutation rate that we could calculate now because we know this is from uh, 1350 uh, and we can measure how many mutations occurred over the last 670 years. And what we actually calculate is that it's about one mutation in 10 years in the genome. And it was five years, so it makes a lot of sense. So this was actually then also confirmed. What Maria also had was a number of genomes from the post-Black Death, because after the Black Death, it's around, like I said, for 300 years, there is 7,000 recorded outbreaks of plague in the kind of historical records over the last uh, 700 years. And she had many genomes from that. And they all kind of come out of the Black Death. First of all, she has some from London from a later outbreak and some from Eastern Europe. And you can actually see those ones here, they come out of the Black Death, but they are on the branch that leads to the, to the, to the branch one, which is the third pandemic, the one that spreads from, 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 uh, from Hong Kong, as I, as I mentioned. So it really seems that the evolution towards branch one happened in Europe. That's also interesting because 
we didn't really expect that the, the that the one that was disseminated in the world from Hong Kong that you find the Grand Canyon today that you find in Madagascar evolved in Europe. We really thought that's from Asia, but it actually evolved in Europe and migrated back to Asia and then was disseminated in the 19th century. So the microevolution, the little steps towards that um, 19th century uh, strain were actually happening in Europe, which is quite interesting. And then you have a whole lot of other genomes that all come out of the Black Death, which give rise to this branch, which is basically the post-Black Death branch, which is only present in Europe. It's not present anywhere in the world today anymore. It's extinct because we don't have plague in Europe today anymore. We only have it very far in Eastern Europe, and there we actually see the branch one. But in Central Europe, it's gone. So it seems that it established a reservoir. So after the Black Death, there must have been some animal population that carried plague until it disappeared in the 18th century. We don't know what it is. Most likely, it's the black rat, right? It's actually quite interesting because in the 18th century, the black rat is also disappearing because it gets replaced by the brown rat. That's the rat that you are probably most familiar with. I don't know how it is quite in the kind of where you are because in the Western part of North America, you have still black rats. But from the Eastern part of North America, the brown rats are actually invading. And that happens almost everywhere. If you introduce brown rats to black rats, the black rats basically disappear because the brown rats are quite aggressive towards black rats and black rats disappear. But black rats live closer with humans. They live in the house like a mouse, whereas the, black, uh, the brown rats fortunately usually don't live in the house. I mean, you might have seen them in the basement or in the, in the sewage or somewhere, uh, but usually they don't live with you. They, you don't have them under your bed, but that was actually how it was with black rats. And black rats then of course have fleas and those fleas were also the major uh, kind of reason of transmission. So it really seems that this just, with the disappearance of black rats, also the, 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 the disease seems to disappear um, in Europe. Um, and then she has a number of genomes, which are the latest ones. So those are the ones from the final kind of uh, second pandemic. And for those ones, it's actually interesting because if you look at their genome, um, they have a gap. There's something missing. There's a large deletion. So something that was deleted out of their genome. Um, and what it has been deleted is, is interesting because it is, first of all, genes that are related to the movement of the bacteria. So the kind of uh, pseudotuberculosis, the close relative has actually a flagellum, like a propeller that makes them move, um, but they lost those genes. But that kind of makes sense because they want to evade the human immune system. But part of that was also that they lost genes which are part of the virulence. So those strains in the, in the late 18th century were less virulent than the ones early on. So it seems that it kind of loses a bit of uh, its aggressiveness. And it's interesting because I will not talk about the Justinianic plague, but we have genomes from that time as well. And also towards the end of the Justinianic plague, actually the same region in the genome gets lost. So it's kind of parallel, what we call convergent evolution. So the same thing disappears in the genome. So it, it, there seems to be some sort of driver that, that causes the loss of this region in the genome. Um, and that probably, or maybe contributed to why it then disappeared um, as well. So really the story for the Black Death is it gets, um, now we have good support that it, it comes from the East, it gets introduced in the 14th century, and then moves back in the 14th century also into Central Asia, and then um, disseminates in the 19th century with the third pandemic. So that's just something that we now have good molecular also um, evidence and how it disseminated. Um, so we have also been looking at the Justinianic plague, but don't really have enough time to talk about that today. But what we've also been investigating over the last few years is to look further back in time, because we do have good evidence from historical records from the Justinianic plague, from the Black Death, of course, from the Hong Kong plague. Um, but how about the past? If you go further back in time, was actually a senior pest is already around? We see that it's quite some genetic diversity. So has it been already spreading in the Roman or the post-Roman? Uh, in the pre-Roman time, like in the ancient Greeks, or do we actually find it maybe even further back in time, like in the Neolithic or in the Bronze Age or so? So what we have been doing then is something that we call a metagenomic approach uh, to ask this kind of question. Because if you look further back in time, you can't really fish, you can't really do a fishing expedition to look for something specific. Because if you do this capture that I mentioned on this piece of glass, you have to put something on, but you, if you don't know what it is, it could be smallpox, it could be tuberculosis, it could be salmonella enterica, it could be anything. It's kind of hard to look for everything with the kind of physical device that can fish out everything. So what we had to do is something we call a metagenomic approach, where we just take all the DNA that we can extract from an ancient mass grave or from an ancient individual and look to what organism does it actually belong. And a few years ago, this was quite challenging because the algorithms, the bioinformatic tools were not good enough, but fortunately we're quite lucky that we could 
work with a very capable team of people and had some really powerful um, approaches uh, to, to, to look at this data. Um, so we had uh, been working with Alexander and, and Daniel Husson, who's a professor at the Tübingen University. They developed a tool that's called MOLD, a MOLD called Megan Alignment Tool. It takes a database, and this database can be literally all the genomes that there are in the world, and it then compares those genomes to your data that you have. And it can actually align them simultaneously to all the data. And that was something that was impossible, uh, like I said, a few years ago, but this tool really allows that and is quite fast. It can look at a billion reads in less than 24 hours. And the best tool before would have taken one year to do the same thing. So it's really much faster. Of course, uh, like if uh, you give a project to a PhD student where he has to wait for one year before he gets his final results, I mean, that, that probably wouldn't really work, right? Because you have to do the analysis again and again, but uh, just waiting a day is of course uh, always possible. And then Felix and, and Ron, a PhD student and a postdoc in the lab, they actually extended this uh, tool a bit further. And they were then able to use this tool to screen more than 2,000 skeletons that we had in our collection where we had um, uh, data that we had produced mostly to look at the human DNA, but now they could also look at the potential pathogens present in those. And they could do that simultaneously. They didn't really have to target one, but they could look at everything, right? And you could really look at 10,000 of samples if you, if you have the data from those. And they and also other groups now have identified uh, indeed plague in quite deep prehistory. In fact, in the Stone Age, in the late Neolithic, we already have plague. So the oldest genome that we now have is about 5,000 years old from the so-called Yamnaya culture, so from the Northern Caucasus. Um, but we've also, uh, another group has found it in the, in the Altai Mountains, but we've also found it um, in, in several different sites uh, in, in, in Western Eurasia. So it's been actually around for at least 5,000 years. If we then compare the DNA from 5,000 years ago to the modern Yersinia pestis DNA and to the Black Death and the Dersinianic plague, we can actually see it branches off much earlier than the diversity we have today for plague. This is the Stone Age plague. You can actually see the oldest one branches off about 5,000 years. And then this is the oldest one, second oldest, third oldest, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And it's actually quite interesting how they evolve into each other. So one gives rise to two gives rise to three, gives rise to four, gives rise to five, gives rise to six, and six gives rise to seven, um, which is very unusual phylogeny. And it really looks weird because how do you connect those people with the Altai and those people with Central Europe? It kind of first appears strange, but we have also been working on the human DNA over the last five years. We actually figured out this is exactly how humans move during this time because there's this expansion of Yamnaya into the West and into the East that you might have heard of uh, during the so-called steppe migration. And then there's this backwater migration from uh, this population here during the Sintashta period into the uh, so-called Adronovo period where people actually move, move back. So basically the, the pathogen moves with the people at that time. So it makes a lot of sense. So people seem to transmit it or take it along at least. And what is even more surprising is that in the Stone Age plague, there's a large chunk missing and it's not anything that is missing. It's actually some of the genes that are necessary for the transmission of the plague by fleas. This type of pathogens, those type of bacteria would have actually killed the flea. So they couldn't be transmitted by the flea. So this cannot cause bubonic plague. So this pathogen was not bubonic. It was not transmitted by fleas, we're pretty sure. So what remains then, if it's not bubonic plague, septicemic plague, which enters the bloodstream first, how could it happen? It's really hard to explain. So the best explanation now we have is pneumonic. This was pneumonic plague. This was a form of plague that has been transmitted between people, like corona today, right? People were coughing at each other, inhaling it, and then get infected. At least that's kind of the best explanation that we currently have. And that's maybe also why it was moving with people, because people just transmitted it. So it was actually maybe even a human adapted disease. What we now also have is a genome that is about 3,800 years old, so also from the Bronze Age, which in fact falls in the phylogeny, not with Stone Age plague, but it actually falls here. It actually falls basal to modern Yersinia pestis. Actually, kind of, you should see that there's one branch here branching off from, from the others. And if you look at the genome, it's in green here. So this is the Stone Age plague with a big gap, but this green here, the one from, from 3,800 years ago, is actually not having the gap. It's actually bubonic. It actually has all the genes necessary to cause bubonic plague. There's a few more. Um, all those mutations here happened just after it split off from the Stone Age plague. There was about 500 to 1,000 year time period when all the mutations occurred. All the genetic elements were accumulated in the genome necessary for flea transmission. 
So it only took 500 years, starting 5,000 years ago, of the pathogen to, ar to arise that then basically was fully bubonic capable. Also meaning that 4,000 years ago, bubonic plague was already there, whereas 5,000 years ago, it wasn't, right? So it's a really kind of short time period. We now see when it actually evolved and, and, and when it was actually around. Um, and it's interesting because if you know a little bit of human history, 3,800 years ago to about 3,000 years ago is a time of major upheavals in the Mediterranean, for example. It's the end of the Mycenaeans. It's the collapse of the Hittite empire that die of a plague based on historical records. It's the time of the Egyptian plague, which you know from the Bible. Um, it's also the breakdown of the Canaanites uh, and of, of, of Assyrians and kind of many other uh, populations. So it's really an interesting time period when we see this when we see the emergence of bubonic plague. So maybe that is even linked, but as long as we don't have DNA from that uh, individuals, we can't really say that. So in summary, what did I show you today? Um, Yersinia pestis has been responsible for at least three historical pandemics that we do know well. The Black Death itself has almost no differences to modern genomes. So it's actually the mother, as I said, of the modern uh, diversity of uh, branch one. So basically all those genomes out there could still cause the Black Death. So that really has nothing special, which we didn't know 10 years ago. The senior pestis evolved this flea transmission quite recently. So only in the last uh, 5,000 years and somewhere between 5,000 and 4,000 years ago, it has caused epidemic outbreaks in prehistory. Um, how big they were, we're not quite sure. And we could speculate that it might have been even part of the reasons why people moved. At least that has been speculated by some archaeologists that they said, why did people move at that time? Um, maybe it was because there was a large pandemic. Either people were running away from the pandemic or they were actually introducing the pathogen to some places like the Europeans did when they came to America, they introduced pathogens and people died. And that's the reason why, you know, I can talk to you now in English and not in Navajo or some Native American language, right? Because 90% of the Native American uh, population was wiped out by pathogens that were introduced from Europe. At least that's what we think today. And maybe the same happened uh, around 5,000 years ago with the plague being introduced to naive populations that then disappeared and made the way for the steppe people that migrated into those regions. Um, and the earliest bubonic plague, as I said, is already in the Bronze Age, so it's actually quite old, so it has been around for a very long time. Where do we want to go with that in the future? Um, we have been mostly screening materials, so all the ancient genomes that we have available to us right now, you can actually see here in purple, have a very, very strong focus in Europe, but you know the world is much bigger than just Europe, obviously, so we will expand in other parts of the world, and we hope that we get some interesting um, uh, data also from other continents and can kind of enrich the kind of uh, history of infectious diseases in those other places. As you saw in the beginning, we have a very strong focus now on the new world where we're interested into the diseases that were introduced from Europe into the new world that were responsible for uh, this kind of larger pandemics that happened in the 1670s uh, century that are responsible for this kind of like breakdown of Native American uh, cultures and, and civilization. Yeah. So by that, I would like to thank, of course, all the people that did the work and just talked about it. So Kirsty, Alexander, Maria, um, especially um, Marcel, Ida, and Michal were uh, PhD students also, and lots of collaboration partners, the rest of my department. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Johannes. Thank you very much. Very interesting, very informative. Um, yeah, we have people slowly coming up with questions. Um, but let me ask you one, um, uh, my, my, myself. So you mentioned at the very beginning that you have a, a very large number of uh, different projects on this. I just wonder, uh, can you tell us maybe just briefly what is known about our epidemic outbreaks in prehistory? How long back uh, you can go, I mean, uh, what, what, what is known? Yeah. Is it true that all this pretty much emerged in the, only after human civilizations uh, become well established? or there was something else to constrain. There's, there's two aspects of that. One aspect is the historical data, right? I mean, the history starts only 4,000 years ago, more or less. So um, we don't really have historical data from the Neolithic. We don't know if they had major outbreaks. We might have mass graves, but you know, I, I see Martha here. She has been studying some fantastic moth graves in, in Africa, you know, which are even older. Um, you know, maybe those were related to kind of uh, pan, pan, pandemics or something like that, but we don't know because nobody wrote anything down. What we can do is we can, we can look at the convergence and kind of the uh, phylogenies, looking into how do those pathogens 
basically, when do they have the most recent common ancestor? When did they evolve? How, how did they evolve? And what we see is for almost everything that we have studied, so for Salmonella and Terica, we see a nice evolution over 5,000 years, how it becomes a human pathogens causing paratyphoid fever, whereas 6,000 years ago, it was actually a pathogen that was infecting animals and not humans. We see the whole process from a zoonotic transmission to a human adapted pathogen in 6,000 years. For tuberculosis, we find the most recent common ancestor of all the diversity found in the world today about 6,000 years ago. You see near pests, I just talked about 5,000 years ago. Leprosy, probably a bit, quite a bit deeper. So evolving very, very slowly, but we don't know where it's coming from. Um, but the majority of infectious diseases we think emerges during the Neolithic, when the human population becomes sedentary, people settle down, it's called the first epidemiological transition uh, theory. So we think that that's really the point when humans become interesting, right? It's also about population size. When there were just a few million people all over the world, it was very unlikely for a pathogen to spread all over the world. Now that we are seven or eight billion people, we've just seen it. It took like, what, three weeks or four weeks uh, until Corona was everywhere in every corner, in every country of the world, right? Because we're so highly connected. And that basically only started with the Neolithic. And that's really when we see the emergence. Some pathogens not. Heliobacter pylori is around for, I would say, 200,000 years. So we already had that, you know, deep in Africa in our stomachs, as far as we can say, based on the diversity we find in the world today. Uh, the same seems to be true for HPV. So hepatitis B virus that we also studied from the past seems to emerge more than 10,000 years ago. So already before agriculture, so before people can became sedentary and, and settled down. But it really needs a critical population size. And that critical population size was only available, you know, from the Neolithic onwards from maybe 7,000 years because you need enough people in the community for the pathogen to spread and to survive, right? The, the R value that we're all so familiar with these days, you know, has to be above one, otherwise it disappears. In a group of 15 hunter-gatherers, it will just kind of disappear and not become a human pathogen. Thank you very much. And we have uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, is there any agreement regarding why the Black Death main outbreak dropped after five years while well, it uh, still remained in Europe. And maybe you can comment also in, on our outbreaks, why we end. So but, um, yeah. again, we are all <laughs> experts these days about what's happening, right? It's, you know, it, it's basic crowd immunity. That is what happened in the, in the Black Death. Uh, if you think about it was uh, having a mortality, as I said today, it has about 50% mortality of untreated plague. It killed half of all Europeans. That actually means that every European had it, right? Everybody got it. It's not like, it's like Corona runs through the population, right? But with a mortality of 50%. And that's what happened during the Black Death. So what happens then, after five years, everybody who's still alive is immune, right? And all the other people are dead. But there was still a reservoir. There was still some sort of animal population or so where it could hang out that then it emerged actually only 15 years later, which is the next generation, young people suddenly that haven't experienced the Black Death. They're exposed to the new kind of, kind of emergence, the new wave of plague. And then again, a lot of people die. And that's what happened for the next 300 years. It never became as kind of bad as the first pandemic because then it was first introduced, first contact basically. People hadn't seen it all of Europe. Afterwards, you have some people that are immune, and that's the same what will happen to Corona, right? I, I know I, in my lifetime, I will get Corona, everybody will, because it will be around like the other four coronaviruses, which are part of our kind of normal, um, uh, you know, seasonal viruses already. Um, but it won't be as bad because we might have experienced it before, so we have some sort of immunity or we are vaccinated, so we have some sort of immunity, but the vaccination doesn't last more than a couple of years, right? We know that already now people get reinfected. Um, after a year. Um, so it will probably be the same there, but it won't never be as bad as the first time. And that's the good thing about the current pandemic, right? It will never be as, as bad again because a large percent of the population will have it or is vaccinated. So it won't spread as virulent anymore as it was doing that over the last year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then uh, there are several questions uh, that I guess you probably expect. What's so Marta, Marta has a question, actually, Sergey, you might not see her, but I, I can see her. She's raising her hand the whole time, so maybe you will. Uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, yeah, she, she's probably on a different screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to her in a second. Um, there, there are several questions that um, uh, concern the future. So what's kind of uh, your, when we're going to have next one? What is going to be? How bad it will be? Uh, 
I have no idea. I, I, I'm not a <laughs> fortune teller, or I can't really say what's happening in the in the future. I mean, what is clear is the human population becomes bigger and bigger. We will probably stagnate somewhere with 11 billion people on the planet. That's probably what we will have for the next 100 years or so, in maybe 30 or 40 years. Then it probably goes down. So I don't really think that the population will maybe will be kind of leveling off with 10 billion people for the next 100 and 200 years. Um, as far as we can predict that, I mean, of course, if there's nuclear war and some nuthead is kind of, you know, responsible for the football and pressing the wrong button, you know, everything could be over very fast and we might be back in the Stone Age. Um, but if, if the progress is like it currently does, we are a large population and new viruses will evolve all the time. Um, it's just the question, how bad will they be? What's the mortality? If something like Ebola, is spreading fast with a mortality of 50 percent i mean then we're really you know that's much more devastating than what we have now mortality of three percent is really bad mm -hmm. and we have seen it especially in the us with more than 500,000 people at the end that will have died of corona but um of course it's still a low mortality compared to what we were talking about today a senior pestis mm -hmm. or ebola or some other disease and we just need to monitor it, right? It's, it's a shame that so little money is spent on infectious diseases. As I mentioned 10 years ago, when I started with this, I realized how little we know about the evolution of them. Where do they come from? What is the viral load of the bats? What is the viral load of animal populations across the globe? Why don't we monitor that? Why do we spend billions, billions, thousands of billions of euros to study galaxies 13 billion years away, but we're not monitoring apes, monkeys, bats, you know, all kind of animals and what their virus load is, because that's much bigger threat, right? It caused what, how many trillion of damage did Corona cost uh, over the last year? You know, if we would have spent that money on infectious disease research, we would probably know every single virus in the world. But uh, yeah, hopefully the world will kind of rethink in that regard. Yeah. Uh, has bubonic plague left signals in the human genome in terms of Im immune function? And can such evolution be linked to particular outbreaks? Yeah, I didn't really talk about that. We were looking for that for the last 10 years. And I should say we haven't found any kind of strong evidence that it did. Um, and that's also reflected in the history. If you think about it, it's around for 5,000 years. It still has a high mortality. It's not that we became immune. It doesn't really seem that the kind of mortality has really changed uh, in the kind of larger outbreaks. So no, we haven't. There were some candidates that people suggested in the past, like CCR5. Uh, but we couldn't really confirm that CCR5 has already a high frequency in the Iron Age. Um, so it's, yeah, we can't really, we don't have good evidence. Short answer. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, a really interesting talk. I wonder how did the genes that lead to flea transmission evolve? Free tr uh, flea transmission. Yes, that's a good question. I mean, we don't know where they came from. It's a, it's such a, such a nifty kind of mechanism, right? It's, it's, it's really incredible how this evolved within very short time. Um, and how it became fully adapted. But yeah, it's, it's you know, evolution. It's, it's amazing what it sometimes does, kind of how complex evolution can be. Um, and that's just another kind of, you know, puzzle how, how those things uh, emerge. We don't know where it's from. We, we haven't found the bacterium that donated those genes. Uh, we do know it's a donation. So basically they come from some other organism. They recombined into the genome. So they're not present in the common ancestor, but they were basically inserted into the genome of uh, the Yersinia pestis lineages today. But where did they come from? We do not know. We haven't found um, the origin of, of those genes yet. Mm -hmm. um, is there any connection be between bubonic plague and the Bronze Age collapse around 1200 BC? Personally, I think yes, but we don't have good evidence for it. Uh, we do have now more and more evidence that it's around in the late uh, second millennium uh, BCE. Um, and it's certainly around the step that's very clear, but we don't really have good DNA preservation. And we don't really have, I mean, if anybody knows about Hittite burials <laughs> or any kind of burials from the 12th to the 14th century BCE, you know, we would be more than excited to work on them. The funny thing is around 1500 BCE, people suddenly start cremation all over Western Eurasia, everywhere in England, in Spain, in Central Europe, in Anatolia, everywhere people start with cremation. By 1100 uh, BCE, everybody's cremating. There's very few pockets where people don't do cremation. What triggered that? Why do people everywhere adopted that culture, right? And it's really independent. It really seems to emerge independently. And I think Blake is probably the best. We, we do know that's what people also uh, did in the medieval time. And there's a very high chance that this is the reason why they did it. 
And that's maybe also the reason why it disappeared because at least then we don't really have uh, it causing larger outbreaks um, as, we, as, we, as we see um, in the later periods. When people again, because they become Christian, stop cremation, right? The Romans were still cremating, but then mm -hmm. good Christians don't do that. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, th that body with a lot of fleas that are full of uh, Yersinia pestis bacteria better burn it than have it close to you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, let me ask one more question from the audience and I'll uh, check with our panelists. Uh, how do you control for biases in the assembly of ancient genomes? I, uh, is it possible to miss out on variants because parts of the genome got deleted on the way to recent strains and cannot be captured due to degradation? Yeah, that is, that is a true concern, right? If you think about what we do as a capture approach, and in general, you can only capture what you know, right? So this is also a problem, say, if, if, if somebody would show me T-Rex DNA, I could probably not assemble it because, you know, I might have a chicken, which is the closest relative to, to a T-Rex, um, but, you know, the chicken genome and the T-Rex genome is probably so different that I cannot assemble the T-Rex genome, even though I have good kind of quality ancient DNA, but it's, it's still, it's too much broken into small pieces, so I can't stick it back together. And what we can do is something that's called a de novo assembly. So we can actually take the puzzle pieces and let the computer figure it out, right? It kind of sees what's matching and the overlaps and kind of tries to build it together. And then little scaffolds and then sticking the scaffolds together and kind of like context and then basically creating a whole genome. And that's something that we have in fact done for Yersinia pestis. So we have a genome from, from London where we have really good quality high, uh, I think 150 X coverage or so, where we could do a de novo uh, assembly and that actually worked. And we didn't really see anything that we were missing like another plasmid or a large insertion or deletion or something like that. And it even doesn't make a lot of sense if you think evolutionary because it's the mother, right? The Black Death is the mother. So how could it then not be present in the daughters that live still today? It would have been present in the mother and then all the children have lost it in parallel and that's not how evolution works. So the common ancestor kind of by definition usually has at least one of the surviving strains has the elements that the mother also had. So it's not that everything gets lost uh, in parallel. Um, so I don't really think that this is what we would see. For viruses, it's a bit different because they have a much faster evolution. But for, for bacteria, I think as far as we can say, this is not how it works. Because basically all the modern genomes that we have from the whole phylogeny, from the fourth family tree I showed you, have the same number of, 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 of those kind of elements. And they have, have this flea adaption for the last 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Ma Ma Martha, did you have a question? Yes, I do that. First of all, Johannes, thank you very much for the talk. It was fascinating. I have two, can I ask two questions? Sure. I take privilege. So my first question relates to what you said that in both the Justinian plague and the Black Death, towards the end of the 300 years duration, you'll, you find genomes that are missing those virulent genes. And you said that is convergent. Do you have any idea of the process that leads to that convergence? Short answer, no. It's fascinating to observe that because it's really weird. It's that this is true. At the end of the pandemic, in both, in both cases, it's the same just region. Extraordinary. Yeah. So, but okay. we don't know. It's, it's, we, don't, we can't even explain it. I mean, the truth is that for a lot of this work that we're doing, we're a bit fishing in the dark because to really test the hypothesis that we have, we would have to recreate those bacteria and test them on animal models to yeah. see how virulent are they? What are they actually doing? What's their phenotype? Like even the one from the Stone Age, it's extinct today. We don't have it in the world today anymore to understand how it works, how it's transmitted. We would have to recreate it and infect some animals. It may be something that, you know, it's an ethical debate, right? Should we do that or should we not? <laughs> should we resurrect a pathogen that might have been responsible for a large scale pandemic? On the other hand, evolution might just bring it up tomorrow, right? It might arise tomorrow in Kazakhstan. And the better, better we have actually understood, like in Corona, if we would have known that five years ago, we already have a vaccination, then we wouldn't be in a pandemic right now. So better knowing what is out there in detail and understanding it than, uh, than how not it works. Yeah, no, fascinating. Can I ask you a quick other question? So looking at the tree, and I, I know about the Bronze Age and that history and becoming the flea adapted, and then there's the branching for the Justinian and then the root of the current uh, Yersinia pestis. Do you know, or do you have any idea where are the reservoir populations in these last 5,000 years? 
It's a very good question. Today we have it mostly in Central Asia, right? We have 40 animal species that harbor Yersinia pestis, and it's pretty much not restricted. It's not that the one branch or one strain is only found in groundhogs and another one is found in squirrels and another one is found in whatever kind of uh, rabbits or something like that, but it's actually found moving between different animals. So there's busy this network in the steppe where it seems to survive well and you have it also in groundhogs in North America, which is also kind of a steppe living um, animal which lives in burrows and that's probably like human population is just a nice environment for fleas to hang out in the winter and probably it, it remains in fleas for a very long time and um, it's probably the most of the life cycle that actually spends inside a flea and not so much inside a rodent killing it and then uh, getting getting um, passed on um, but where it is in Europe we don't know we don't even know what animal it is like I speculated for the bubonic um, plague and the, after the second pandemic it's probably rats it's probably black rats I still think this is the best explanation that rats are harboring it. For the Justinianic plague, probably also rats, right? So that it's around in rats. We have a pretty big rat population already in the Roman time. We have even just doing some analysis on ancient rat genomes. Um, and there's even a paper that was just published where they found in ancient rats from the Black Death, uh, Yersinia pestis. So that's you know as good as it goes, right? We have no rats uh, that actually harbored it. So that's probably the reservoir during the Black Death. But where it was then hanging out for the next 300, 400, 500 years before it emerged back or where it was hanging out between rat uh, infection, um, that is that's a good question. It's probably in some, some reservoir population in, 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 the, in the steppe, I mean, because it goes down to basically you have a diversity in the Justinianic plague that disappears and then you have another strain that emerges that becomes a black death. So you have those events that probably also reflect outbreaks within animal populations like you observe today sometimes in Kazakhstan you have years where you have just a lot of uh, actually uh, rodents uh, where you have an explosion right where the conditions are perfect for lots of rodents and then of course the population of fleas is increasing the population of Barcina pestis is increasing and such an event then could then lead into a spread into the human population um, so I do think the reservoir is some rodent, but we don't know which one it is. And each time is a jump, it's an interspecies jump, but not between the medieval Black Death and the Hong Kong Black Death. Did that remain in humans all along, or did it no, jump again? Not. That's actually interesting because the Justinianic plague did not give rise to the Black Death. The Justinianic yeah. plague brain that disappears, right? It's gone. It actually it diverges from the one that caused the Black Death about two thousand years ago. And then it just disappears. And then out of one that is probably some rodent population in Central Asia emerges the one that becomes the Black Death. We probably think in Central Asia, we have even some really good data that kind of supports the idea that it's from some Central Asia. And then there's some event that causes it to spread out of the animal, uh, out of the reservoir, uh, the, 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 what we call foci, the, the kind of the, the, the uh, wild rodent population, and then probably gets into the commensals, into the animals that live with humans like like rats or mice and then it causes some outbreak inside the commensals right so usually what we think at least is that what happens before the pandemic within humans is actually a pandemic inside the rodent population and um, so there has been some speculation uh, by Mike McCormick and other people that that what caused the Justinianic plague was actually a large outbreak in the rat population which was caused by the earthquake of 538 that destroyed large parts of Constantinople and there was so much rubble, there was so much destruction that it was perfect conditions for rats because they could eat the food under the rubble, right? They could basically, they were expanding. There was a large kind of population and it, eventually they had eaten everything up, right? They were starving and the starving population is weak and might be perfect for rats and flea. And then they're dead. And then, you know, what's the next warm body? That's a human. And then it just emerges within the human population. Those kind of speculations is, is well possible, but you need the commensals. Every case of medieval plague, or at least the majority, more than 90%, is a zoonotic transmission from an animal. So it's not that people were transmitting the disease to other people, we think. It was largely bubonic, so it was a flea biting, and usually it's, it's red fleas, and the red flea was basically biting animals, so it was uh, uh, humans, so it's basically animals living with the humans, and then animals are dying and then the fleas are just jumping to the to the people and then infecting people but it was not really human fleas as far as we know it's mostly rat fleas uh, that are really good in transmitting uh, Yersinia pestis so it was always it's everything 50 million zoonotic events basically um, that's what people amazing think. thank you Johannes that was wonderful
Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's a related question or comment. So it's possible that the plug dies out because the rat population uh, dies out or it decreases. Yes, absolutely. I think if the rat population disappears, we would hypothesize that also the plague disappears. And I think that's also one of the main reasons why we do not have plague around today anymore because yeah, we just ha don't have as much rat. Uh, a population, but also we have now the brown rat and not the black rat. Uh, yeah. The black rat has been mostly replaced. It's actually on the endangered list in Germany, the, the black rat. You wouldn't think that. If you go to the train station here, you see a lot of rats, but they're all brown rats, they're not black rats. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Yeah, there are two more questions. Um, uh, why didn't the black plague uh, plague spread out of Europe? Um, I think Europe at that time just had really good uh, conditions for, for, for plague. I mean, there were large cities, the medieval time, you know, if you think about sanitation, canalization, all those things, you know, were much better in the Roman time than they were in the medieval Europe, even though it was a thousand years later. I think it was just perfect conditions for rats and fleas and people were living very dense and, you know, you know, the movies, you know, kind of all the historical documents from that time, you know, no, none of us would have <laughs> been happy to live at that time. It was pre pretty, uh, probably uh, problematic in terms of sanitation and yeah, that was just really good conditions and then it's just large population sizes, big cities like London at that time, right, was, you know, probably more than 100,000 people and yeah, that just caused massive outbreaks. Thanks. Uh, how does this work with tissues from ancient individuals compare with similar uh, pathogen studies that can be done with dental uh, calculus? And do the two methods tell the same story or different or complementary? I didn't really get the question completely. So the ancient tissues compared to modern day tissues. Yeah, yeah. Think, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's about the same. I mean, it depends a bit what you want to study. Say if you want to study calculus, for example, right, which is a biofilm that forms, you know, now that you're kind of listening to me um, on your teeth, um, that's a biofilm made of bacteria in your mouth. Um, if I compare that calculus in your mouth now to um, the one that I get from an ancient skeleton from 500 years ago, I find a lot of differences, but they're not necessarily caused because 500 years ago, people had different bacteria in their mouth. It's just because they degrade differently. Um, and, uh, you know, some survive, some don't, or some fossilize in your mouth and become true calculus. The other one's just plaque, which is forming, you know, is the rough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is, uh, uh, clarification just came compared to ancient calculus. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So if you compare ancient calculus and modern calculus, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or modern, we don't call it plaque, right? We don't call it calculus because calculus is really what forms over time. So if it's ancient calculus and modern calculus, a true calculus, um, then it should actually be the same. Um, there shouldn't be a big difference. It's only uh, if it once is fossilized, when it's basically, uh, you know, car like, like the uh, phosphopeptide has formed and it has really kind of crystallized and then it's, it's trapped inside the calculus and then it would, would be the same. And that would also be uh, true for other modern tissues. So if I take a tooth from an individual that died last year of the plague from a cemetery in Madagascar or something like that, it would be very similar to a tooth from 500 years ago from London or so. Um, I would get similar degraded DNA and uh, it would be actually quite, quite similar. Only if it's fresh from yeah, somebody who died yesterday, the DNA is much longer and higher quality. I could culture the bacteria. I could actually get high quality DNA to get a really good quality genome. There's amazing genetic techniques now to get uh, single genomes within no time with very long reads. There's all kind of fancy things you can do with modern DNA, which we cannot do with ancient DNA because it's broken into small pieces. But the kind of uh, the mixture, the, what, it, what it's made of is actually very, very similar. That doesn't really change. Okay, uh, that's it. Uh, Thank you very much, Johannes. I really appreciate it. Uh, for an interesting talk. And thank you, everybody, uh, for your attention. And we hope to see you in, uh, here next week when uh, Chris Stringer will be talking about what is Homo sapiens. Thank you very much again. Sure. Have a good day. Thanks for the invitation. Bye, Marta. Ciao, ciao.